right now, solar panels are assembled in China. Now, there's nothing about that technology that prevents it from being relocated. We've been making solar panels in various qualities since the 70s. But making the actual solar cells is the easy part. Assembling everything requires fingers and eyes. You can't automate that. America is too expensive. Mexico is too skilled. So we would need to find another country that we can kind of fold into the network to make that happen. If I was a betting man, I would say Colombia. They're relatively proximate. There's already a free deal, free deal with the United States. Uh, the, the education uh, levels for Colombian labor is high for their standard of living. And the labor costs are kind of where the Mexicans were in the 1980s. So you can do it, but you have to build all that industrial plant first. And you have to do so in an environment when North America is already trying to double their industrial plant because of deglobalization, because we have cheaper energy, because we have a more stable labor market. So all this has to be done at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have some significant inflation for several years that is unavoidable, even with good planning. Mm -hmm. we, we keep touching on China too. Um, one thing that I've heard you know, in so many sectors is that China is rising. China is the next big superpower Ray Dalio is a big, big hedge fund guy. He just put out a, a big viral video. It's had tens of millions of views all about how China is going to be the next global superpower. Uh, what do you see ahead for China? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, the open question at this point is whether the Chinese manufacturing model collapses this year. There's no way it's going to survive the decade. Mm -hmm. uh, the China's population is in collapse. The one child policy is now 40 years old. They have been revising some of their census data. They now think that they overcounted their population by in excess of 100 million people. They were the fastest aging, fastest collapsing demography in human history before that data revision. Now we're just looking at a collapse of their ability to be competitive in anything. So the question is not, will China be the superpower? The question is how soon will China collapse as a nation state? And that is definitely gonna be this decade at this point. Uh, we also know that because of the Ukraine war, the Chinese are likely to get less stuff from the Russians than they did before, because most of the stuff that China imports from Russia comes from Eastern Siberia. The Russians don't have the technology to operate the fields in Eastern Siberia and all the foreigners have left. So those are all shutting down. So China is the big loser from most of these shifts, whether it's the Ukraine war, or deglobalization, or depopulation, or populism. Uh, they're the farthest away from where the raw materials are coming from. They don't have a Navy that allows them to go out and get them themselves. They are completely at the United States' mercy for the success or failure of their system. And the Americans just are done doing that sort of heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in your book, there, there are these sections about different things in the world that are happening. And it seems in each of them, there's there's a bit where you get in China and it's often, you know, there's a footnote that says, actually, <laughs> it's way worse for China than I even laid it out to be in the beginning. It, it's so surprising when there's this narrative around China right now. What do you think is, is promoting this narrative that, that China is so big and powerful? Two things. Um, number one, the Americans aren't happy unless they're stressed about something. And <laughs> It's easy to stress about a boogeyman. We were stressed about the Soviets until they collapsed in a day. We, most of us didn't see that coming. So China is just the next iteration of that. Same thing with Japan. Uh, also, we've had the perfect environment for the Chinese for the last 50 years, mm. especially in the post-Cold War system where the United States was holding up the ceiling of globalization and maintaining market openness uh, without a cost. And so a lot of countries, whether it's in Europe or Asia, have really done well in that environment, but it's all dependent on the United States continuing to do that. And we're not anymore. Uh, and let me give you a third one real quick. Uh, that's not demography and not manufacturing. I had where did it go? <laughs> Sorry, slipped my mind. Is it finance? As soon as debt. you ask the next question, I'm sure it's going to pop right back in. <laughs> Could it be finance or debt? Oh, finance. Thank you. Oh, my God. Okay. So with the baby boomers being mature, but not retired yet, we have been in the greatest capital bubble in human history with labor costs. I'm sorry, with uh, capital costs being the lowest they've ever been and capital systems being the most liquid in that environment when cost of finance is no longer really an issue, everyone builds out everything. 
because it makes sense if interest rates are one versus interest rates being 10. And in that environment, China was able to develop with a speed and a fervor that no country in history has ever been able to contemplate. But now that labor costs are higher, now that manufacturing costs are higher, now that financial costs are higher, you have to make the case for each individual development in a way, uh, not just in China, but for foreigners going into China that couldn't be, can't be done in the way that it's been done in the last 30 years. So this is a seizing up of the overall system. And just like in any recession, the folks who have better cash flow and better financial connections and better economics for whatever they're trying to do, those are the ones that make it through. Everything else shakes out. Everything in China is going to shake out. Hmm. Uh, you, you mentioned learning Spanish. And it's, it's so funny because back to this Chinese narrative, you know, I know people who are very successful, who are taking Chinese lessons, taking calligraphy lessons. They're making dumplings. They're, they're embracing this China narrative. And it's so funny to hear you embrace learning Spanish as a valuable skill. Um, I, do yeah, want to I, mention I see learning Chinese today a lot like um, trying to fake a Southern accent in 1860. Um, if you want to be a carpetbagger, great plan. Uh, but if you want to be a traditional business person, uh, not so much. That was a clip from my most recent interview with Peter Zion. To catch the full interview, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell.